actually my whole life in research, so I didn't really you know, kind of get a decent job. I did a PhD in ubiquitous and variable computing uh, and then I moved to Japan. I just thought I'd stay a year. I was in Osaka, uh, Osaka Prefecture University for um, some uh, at a computer vision lab with Koichi Kise. And since five years or so on, I'm now at uh, Keo, Keo Media Design. And uh, originally, however, um, I'm, you know, kind of from the variable computing community. Uh, so uh, I thought, you know, kind of we would be using these devices that you see on slide right now. And I see, you know, kind of everybody in the audience has now their headphone display and their uh, keyboard somewhere. And also this didn't really happen, but uh, I started working with uh, the, the Cubic um, uh, down in the corner, that's a belt integrated computer from ETH, we ported Linux on it. So it was more or less working on this uh, hardware setups. And um, at the beginning of my work, you know, kind of maintenance scenarios, uh, uh, work with firefighters uh, and uh, other kind of, um, um, yeah, um, uh, activity recognition scenarios. And uh, since a couple of years, however, I'm also more interested in what's going on in your mind. So I started uh, looking a little bit into eye tracking and also into uh, some other physiological uh, signals and physiological sensing. Uh, that's uh, an old picture uh, from uh, the research group uh, here in uh, KMD. Uh, that's uh, our house temple in, in Kyoto. So. Uh, I'm working with Taka, he's a Buddhist monk, uh, also did some works on, on meditation and, and uh, similar works. And uh, just also here uh, to uh, get you oriented, uh, this is uh, Tokyo. And um, we have our, you know, kind of main campus in uh, Hiyoshi that is now mostly closed. So I'm mostly at home uh, doing remote lecture. Um, and we also have a place at the Mirai Khan, the, um, science uh, museum uh, where we could hold workshops, but this is also currently not really happening. The except of uh, I'm still uh, sometimes visiting uh, visiting Jins, and I'll get to that also later. The relationship to the company and uh, uh, what it has to do also with my work. Uh, they are building smart glasses, and then now from a, um, a research perspective. Um, for my PhD and for a lot of my work, um, I first focused on on physical physical activities, and uh, you know, kind of, I started early with um, I think this idea that we probably also share that uh, if you're working in a, a computation in the environment um, with computers, um, you soon realize that uh, you know, kind of, the bottleneck is not the CPU, the RAM, or, you know, kind of any a property of uh, the computing machine, but it's actually human attention. So, uh, and I, I realized that very early on in the background, you see two pictures from my desks, one in Passau, one at Park uh, Palo Alto Research Center. And I realized pretty soon that, you know, kind of, if you have uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 or so on computers around you, even if it has a very intuitive, if, even if they have a very intuitive interface, um, it will be too hard for you to configure each one of them. And so then for my PhD, I worked a lot in activity recognition and context aware systems. And then at a time, uh, that looked uh, like this. So you had a maintenance worker at the machine wearing a head-mounted display and, you know, kind of depending on what they do in the machine, uh, they uh, would see, you know, kind of some error or so on popping up. And I mostly worked on the context recognition side. So this is just uh, for illustration purposes, one of the systems that we worked on at the time. So just, uh, you know, kind of this uh, type of sensing pipeline. So you have IMUs on top, you apply some type of filtering, you apply some kind of decision making on top of that. And um, uh, that was kind of the, the work that I was doing. And we used these uh, Christmas tree setups, we called it. So we put a lot of sensors onto the body of a person and then uh, try to figure out what they're actually doing. Uh, in the middle uh, of the slide, you can also see my grandma uh, actively supporting my research. Uh, so you know, kind of we did these recordings. Uh, however, um, uh, what then happened was, uh, you know, kind of now you have actually 
much better sensing in your your smartphone than the the stuff that we used uh, back then in 2000 2003 and 5 and so on uh, so um you know kind of i thought activity recognition then slowly became mainstream uh, phys physical activity recognition and then for me the question was okay what is next you know kind of what uh, can i do that is uh, maybe more interesting and then uh, work started on uh, the cognitive side so uh, this was work uh, with uh, koichi kise in osaka i was looking into uh, eye, eye tracking at the time and at the time then specifically in reading habits because that's still uh, something some cognitive task that you can easier recognize um, you know you can just see from a person looking at uh, the uh, book and from the eye movements that they are actually reading and we did uh, quite some uh, work there in um, just detecting how much reading you're doing um, and also what kind of documents you're reading quite important for uh, Japanese students we can distinguish just based on eye movements if you're reading a textbook or a manga and we can give summary over the week you know kind of how much textbook versus manga reading uh, uh, an individual was doing and uh, then we also looked a little bit into uh, reading comprehension but that was actually much uh, much more difficult uh, however uh, coming also from the variable computing um background uh, you know kind of even the eye tracking or so on i really didn't like that much because i just felt it is too obtrusive it's too interfering with the tasks that you want to do and actually i got very interested in in brain sensing so i dipped my foot a little bit into fnears and also eeg work however i just felt you know it's really obtrusive it's really uh, difficult to uh, get um, into the sensing and you know kind of if you think about also what people in neuroscience are using um, and uh, you know kind of that's already a, a big uh, leap so this is the most variable um, magneto and Holography or so on. I think this is Nottingham University and uh, UCL that built that. So if you really want to understand, you know, kind of what is going on in the brain, what is going on in terms of uh, uh, cognitive tasks, and this is, you know, kind of uh, what you. This is the best you can do right now, and you know, kind of that a person can even drink a coffee or so on is already impressive for that type of sensing. So that's not really, however, how we interact with the world. And I just wondered, you know, kind of, can we have something that is, you know, definitely not as accurate, but can give us a little bit of information of uh, what is going on in our mind, what is going on in our cognitive activities with everyday uh, devices. And uh, we started with the eye tracker uh, we did also a little bit of work with Google Glass. However, um, these were still quite obtrusive. So I still have the problem that uh, if you're interacting with an eye tracker, people will, you know, kind of just, uh, um, you know, look at you differently. And also in terms of uh, battery power, you have the problem that uh, this was the SMI eye tracker, but also I think the newest Toby is you will probably get three to five hours maximum out of that in terms of um, uh, recording. Uh, so, you know, kind of there are these issues if you have, if you want to have something that is unobtrusive and long-term, they are not really, um, uh, it's not really feasible and yeah and it might also look awkward i think the newer ones now also the what is it pupil and visible and so on look quite nice and then was quite happy that i could uh, team up um yeah so five years ago now six years ago actually with jeans the company that i mentioned before um because they were starting their glasses company and they started developing or wanted to go towards smart glasses and you see them in the lower corner uh, jeans meme uh, that um, uh, I worked on uh, together with the company and the point of these glasses was it's not an eye tracker it's also not a full-fledged computing device uh, like a google glass it's uh, more or less just uh, some smart glasses that have sensing integrated into them so you know kind of the accuracy is way lower than what you can get with uh, an eye tracker however you get some electrodes and the nice thing is you get something that is more 
I would say, uh, a variable, you know, kind of looks like normal eye glasses. They weigh uh, 32 grams. Uh, they have a three axis accelerometer, three axis gyroscope in it. And the most interesting part, however, is they have uh, electrodes around the nose that can detect some very limited uh, eye movements. I can show maybe uh, the glasses on the table. So these are the chins meme. They have uh, the three electrodes around the nose. You might know EOG. So in this case, usually you use one um, below the eye, one electrode and one above the eye to detect up and down movement. Uh, in this case, we're using these two electrodes to detect the up and down movement and these two electrodes uh, to detect the left and right movement. Your eye is a deep hole. So just as the uh, background info, and I can show maybe the small, if zoom once I can maybe show a small demo if that still works. So um, that's old work. So I always have to check if it's still kind of working. Uh, so if I share my screen, Okay. Oh, where's my where did Zoom go? Sorry. Ah yeah. Okay. Um sorry, it takes a little bit of setup. Uh, so you should be able to see my screen and uh, just as a reference, my face on the left, because otherwise it's probably hard to, to see. Uh, so in this case, so this is the raw data from the electrodes. Uh, this is vertical. So this means uh, if I'm blinking, you should see the blink in the sensor data. Uh, and also if I'm moving my eyes up and down and uh, then also uh, the same for the left and right. So if I move my eyes left, right, left, right, left, right. You should see the spikes in the data. So that's kind of uh, an eye tracker for poor people more or less, or not really eye tracker, but more or less. Uh, um, uh, so now how do I stop sharing my screen? I have, ah, here, the button was hidden. Okay, so uh, back again. Uh, so, oops, now I'm, so uh, that's more or less, uh, so the genes meme, uh, what you can do with this is, um, uh, or what we did with this is, um, we detect the, the reading activity, for example, so you can detect um, uh, if somebody is reading on the, left and right eye movement. The other interesting thing that I will come uh, back to later also is you could detect um, talking because then, you know, kind of your head movement is uh, stronger and uh, also you have more eye blinks. And uh, we started with this um, for quite a while. I'm kind of the uh, academic outreach for the company. So we'll, we gave out the classes to a couple of institutes and uh, um, tried to foster some some um, collaboration with them. Uh, oh yeah, we also we then also looked into uh, more cognitive activities, especially uh, alertness and uh, and fatigue. We had a long term long term just the two weeks, but with sixteen participants a study on um, fatigue. Here we looked into um, the glasses. So we gave out the glasses and we gave out a smartphone uh, and uh, ground truth for every two hour was uh, um, a sleepiness scale and uh, a PVT, so psychomotor vigilance task. That means you measure the reaction time on the glasses and uh, uh, then we correlated the reaction time with the eye blinks and, uh, and the uh, eye movement so we can actually classify 
uh, the level of alertness uh, based on uh, the EOG. Uh, here, the interesting point was that uh, uh, at the first time, this was uh, Ben Benjamin Tag, uh, he also knows him quite well, he's now in Melbourne. Uh, he tried to uh, do this first with a sleepiness scale. And if you were trying to assess alertness or fatigue, don't use scales, don't use questionnaires because people don't know how tired they are. It gave us, you know, kind of really help for the story later on because we could say, hey, you know, kind of you think how tired you are, but you actually have no clue. You really have to do a PVT or some kind of reaction test to get that number out. Yeah, you could see, you know, kind of at the end of the day, people tend to feel uh, sleepier, but otherwise uh, the, the sleepiness scale was really nearly randomly distributed. So we couldn't use the first recordings we did. Uh, just then when we introduced the PVT, we caught good uh, we could get actually decent uh, co uh, correlations. So then also uh, regarding chins, um, as I mentioned before, before the recording, we're also working on the second version, wanted to um, release that uh, this year, but uh, uh, due to COVID and so on, I think this will take a little bit longer. However, not only I'm uh, working with jeans, but you know, kind of we're working also on our own uh, eyewear and our own sensing in uh, in eyewear glasses. Uh, here is an older example uh, from uh, Katsutoshi Masai. Uh, that's uh, effective wear. Uh, so in this case, um, we build our own sensing into the glasses. This is the first version uh, that detected facial expressions uh, based on. Uh, just photoreflective sensors. So you're measuring the distance from the glasses to the skin. And uh, with that, you can detect uh, then skin deformations. And over that, you can uh, detect um, yeah, the facial expressions uh, of a person. And the nice thing about this, is it's relatively uh, cheap. You can implement it in different headsets. And uh, you will have an easy, you know, kind of uh, smile versus frown counter for the day if you wear that. Uh, here also a small update um, that's also not published yet. Um, I wanted to show a demo, but I screwed up the demo before, so I can just show you the device. Um, so this is the oh, this is being this is recorded. The new effect. So. Yeah, yeah, this is okay. I, I, oh, okay. I just want to make sure. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Uh, I know it's recorded, so that's okay. Uh, it's not published yet, but there's nothing, you know, kind of. Uh, I don't think anybody can 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 steal that or so on. So, uh, so anyway, so the, uh, we have the distance sensors. They are now smaller. Uh, than uh, the ones before. And the interesting part here is now we can do it on the chip. So we have uh, an Arduino directly on board that can actually do the classification. So we got fast enough uh, that we can do the uh, classification on board. We don't have to just send it over over Bluetooth. So that's more or less the, the setup we are using. And we want to do actually long-term recordings now with that. So um, yeah, back to the the slides, uh, yeah, and yeah, we put it also in uh, a head-mounted displays and so on, and I did a couple of uh, um, long-term recordings with it. So uh, not only can you, you know, kind of maybe distinguish uh, specific activities, especially in kind of social interactions are nice uh, uh, because uh, you will have more facial expressions than if you're uh, uh, interacting or sitting at a, a, a desktop or PC. And um, so we did a couple of recordings with this, and we also used a couple of other sensing modalities in smart eyewear glasses. I was interested, I think really for me, it's more variable than you know, kind of the wristbone devices and so on. And I think if we get to a form factor now, or we close to a form factor now, that uh, we can easily integrate enough sensing into that so that it still looks like normal glasses. And I think then we get into a uh, quite interesting um, uh, form factor actually for that. The last sensor that I want to, to show in uh, the, the sensing work is um, a thermal setup uh, that's uh, work in progress more or less, um, but it gave quite good results. So in this case, we're using touchless uh, um, 
thermal sensors on the glasses, so on the top part and on the uh, nose sides. And uh, this is based on, on previous work, uh, related work on thermal cameras, that if uh, you, you know, kind of, if you're relaxed and suddenly uh, you increase cognitive load, so, you know, you start calculating something or so on, what you see is a slight drop in your nose and a slight increase of temperature over here. So the idea is, you know, kind of more blood flows to your brain. That means uh, the nose gets slightly colder. And over here, because uh, there are some uh, blood vessels that also supply the brain, uh, the temperature gets slightly higher. And uh, that was a uh, more or less crazy idea. Uh, however, you know, kind of just from the initial results from the initial, so this is all lab experiments you know, kind of very controlled and uh, not very controlled, but more controlled. So not nothing in the wild, but it looks really that we can see uh, this uh, kind of drop in uh, nose temperature versus the temperature over here. So we use the relative temperature and uh, um, yeah, this is also a little bit confidential, but then um, we have a next version that we can actually now also deploy in the field. If I say confidential, it just means it's not published yet. Uh, but um, uh, so, and then uh, we also use the glasses to um, look into um, interactions. Uh, and that's what I mentioned before, uh, especially uh, the eye blink is something that I found fascinating or interesting. And uh, also the, the uh, synchrony actually in, in eye blink. So uh, we showed for a couple of papers, we could replicate work in uh, in psychology that uh, shows that um, if you're talking face to face to each other, of course, you mimic each other more and also you blink more and uh, you have a significant higher head nod and you get a, a synchrony between two people. And that's also something we did with the glasses. And that's also a direction that I just find really fascinating to, uh, to continue uh, this idea of uh, synchrony and asynchrony in more than you know kind of two or three people uh we get to that a little bit later um there's uh, there's also work we also did uh, some work in in interaction with smart eyewear uh, that's together with uh, that uh, that sterner uh, Butaku, and also aaron quickly and i just put also the uh, students the people that actually do the work uh, shimi uh, cho young and uh, you on uh, the slides um and in that case, we looked into you know smooth pursuit and so on. But I want to show something uh, something different. So this is work from from Chiyong. Oops, I shouldn't. Sorry, sorry if I uh, killed you with the music. Um, so this was a little bit of a fun paper we did for Eastway. Uh, what happened was Chiyong visited me for uh, uh, an internship, and he started also recording data with the Chin's meme. And what we saw is we saw some really strange noise in his data when he was recording it. And then after uh, also recording the video, we saw that he touched his nose very long. And then we could recognize that we can actually use that also for um, interactions. And the interesting part here was then, you know, kind of we thought, oh, this is a fun paper. We brought it out at Ubicom. But then uh, at uh, Ubicom, he was actually using the device uh, for his slides. So he used, you know, kind of left swipe, right swipe uh, for next and previous slide. And uh, at the end of the talk, you know, of course, we got this comment of, hey, um, interesting system, but nobody would use that. And then he could actually say, hey, uh, I use that for the slides. I use that for my presentation right now. Haven't you realized? And then, you know, kind of in a 20 minute uh, presentation, about nose interactions, only about half of the audience actually recognized that he was using the system. So that gave us this idea of, hey, there might be something interesting about uh, nose interactions or so on, or interactions in the face, because they are by far less uh, obtrusive than uh, maybe, you know, kind of looking at your smartwatch or so on. It's much 
more acceptable to touch your face, which is also maybe one of the problems that we have right now with, with COVID. Actually, we are also looking into that a bit uh, for COVID right now, if we can use that uh, to also detect if how often you're touching your nose or you're touching your face. But um, yeah, maybe not no swipes, but uh, maybe something on the face uh, could be actually also okay in terms of interaction design. And now, uh, now I have a couple of uh, uh, slides uh, to give you a little bit more an outlook of the future and stuff that I'm, I'm actually currently more interested in, um, in terms of augmentation. So, you know, kind of when you saw the old work, I'm always interested in, or I was always interested in if I can bring tech closer to our body in a way that is, you know, that uh, wearable techno technology overlaps with with our body and that it's usable and you know kind of I tried a lot of things like you know one-handed keyboards um, and uh, starting with one-handed keyboards and the cubic uh, back during my PhD and nothing really worked that well and you know kind of also now with the eyewear we can detect a lot we can do some limited interaction but i think it's also still not there on a level that i feel that it's overlapping with our body it's really integrated with our environment like maybe with other tools like normal eyeglasses i would say or hearing aids maybe hearing aids is one of the examples where you could say that it's it's closely integrated and it's really a technology uh, that works and in that case maybe a little bit of um of an outlook for uh, next next week, um, I, I stole actually a slide from uh, from Pedro. Um, so you know, kind of this idea of um, uh, slowly a new paradigm for for hum human computer interaction, not looking at a, a small skin between or a small interface layer between the human and the computer, but more looking into how can we integrate devices with our body. I don't like the term human computer integration. Uh, we had a paper with uh, 40, 50 co-authors or so on at the last CHI on next steps in human computer integration. I personally don't like that term too much. I prefer augmented humans uh, because the focus I think should be more on the human side. And with integrated, I also don't mean, uh, you know, implanted, but I just mean uh, more um, straightforward to use and to give you an idea like from 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 our own work um, so um, we're also working now uh, on on haptic actuation and that's a small um, kind of uh, paper from George who looked into um, uh, shape memory alloy and that's an alloy that's a small you know kind of you see it's uh, just a couple of rings around the finger uh, and uh, if you apply current to the alloy, it actually contracts. So you can uh, give pressure on the finger. And now the interesting part here was we just had three rings around the finger and you could apply uh, different uh, levels of pressure. He did a perception study with that. But what you could actually do is you could represent just with the three rings uh, value between zero and a hundred with an error rate of around 10 to 15 percent and it's very subtle so you just feel you know kind of slight pressure on the finger uh, haptics is good because you can concentrate on it but you don't have to you know kind of visually if i throw a red ball up here or so on you will just have to look at it uh, but with haptics you know kind of our brain is quite quite good in filtering that out so you could imagine you have a small progress bar on your finger so you know you touch your credit card you can get the information on how much money is on the credit card or so on without much thinking without much uh, cognitive processing so that's kind of one of the ideas one of the directions uh, that we are that we are going for uh, there's other work oh damn it i forgot to include the video but uh, you can uh, check that out. Uh, there's other work. Um, uh, I just have the picture, which is uh, not not giving. Or can I quickly find the video and show it? Uh, so there's other work. This is a collaboration with Minamisawa, also from KMD and uh, Inami. Um, and in that case, uh, no, damn it. In that case, um, uh, actually, and also yeah, Yaman, especially Yaman and Tomoya, uh, uh, to 
at the time here, PhD students that were working on that, um, they, they give you two extra arms. So basically you have uh, two extra arms and you sit down and we do a remapping between the feet and the arms. And um, I was at the beginning not so interested in the, the robotics, so I'm not really you know, kind of that much interested usually in robotics. But when I tried out the first system, uh, the SIGGRAPH, and I helped Yaman to calibrate it. It was fascinating because, you know, kind of I was sitting there and after maybe at that time, the reaction time was not so fast. After around 10 minutes, I suddenly had this feeling of, oh, I'm not moving my leg, but I'm actually moving an, a third arm, a third and a fourth arm. So when I was very interested in this type of, you know, kind of uh, remapping that it seemed to work at least for me in, in, in some aspects. And uh, can we, you know, kind of make technology that really feels like an extension to ourselves? We continued that work a bit, and I don't know if, if, if Pedro will show that next week, but uh, there is also uh, some collaboration with uh, Pedro and also with uh, Kurita Sensei from Hiroshima University, where we then used um, uh, artificial muscle so this is, uh, it can more or less move your, uh, your hand uh, uh, in uh, different directions. And we did uh, a drumming study with this uh, percussion study uh, where we looked into um, how you can learn uh, some uh, simple rhythms and uh, uh, the setup. So, you know, kind of the one setup where you just hear the rhythm, one setup where you play a score and one setup where you uh, actually uh, just the muscles play the rhythm for you uh, on your uh, arms and uh, that works uh, by far better to learn a new rhythm uh, than uh, just the audio and uh, you seem to do less uh, mistakes and also the timing is, is slightly better. Uh, so that was something that we looked into uh, on the level of uh, integration work. And then the last piece that I want to present uh, uh, today is then also more continuation on these ideas of um, enhancing more the collective experience uh, and uh, uh, what I mentioned before in this term of synchrony. And for that, we've been now working for, uh, and that might be actually nice in a nice uh, continuation of some of the themes from uh, last week uh, from uh, Professor Tanaka, uh, from the uh, music experience and uh, so on. Uh, because uh, what we're trying here is then uh, on this level of, can we create a new collective experience in a theater setting especially? And we look into if it's possible to bring the audience on the stage and create some type of feedback loop between dancers and the audience. And we're still kind of working on that. We had the first, this is one of the first uh, test runs that we did where uh, we streamed just, I think five to six people's uh, heart rate. Uh, that's the middle uh, screen uh, and uh, some uh, head movement from the chins meme and some uh, eye tracking uh, on uh, displays for dance performance. Uh, that's uh, Mademoiselle Cinema uh, Dance uh, uh, Studio uh, here in um, uh, dance group here in Tokyo. And that's also a collaboration with, with Kota, so a colleague from KMD. And we continue that work. And then uh, for the, the later dance performance, um, we uh, wanted to make um, the audience part of the stage. We tried out different sensors. Uh, the uh, standard stuff that we could get uh, didn't really work that well. Uh, first, we went with the Jeans meme, but then, you know, kind of as COVID started, we didn't really want to put things onto uh, people's heads anymore. So we thought about the wrist sensing uh, device, and we actually then just built our own. It's a heart rate and galvanic skin response that you see in the picture. Um, this was confidential, but this is actually now the first paper for this is accepted at TEI. So we recorded uh, three performances with around 40 visitors for each performance. So we record the whole audience, uh, heart, heart, rate, uh, heart rate and uh, electrodermal activity, as well as inertial motion sensor on the wrist uh, for each of the 
audience members. And then what we did is um, the whole piece is actually uh, designed together with the choreographer. So it took us you know, kind of one and a half years or so on in a larger effort with around 20 people or so on to, and with the dancers as well to figure out what kind of sensing to use and what kind of feedback mechanisms to look into. So then we have uh, this setup that actually we have these wristbands on all of the audience. They uh, streamed wirelessly to a server and then um, this does some uh, uh, analysis and then live, we have live changes for the lighting, for the sound. So the sound we have also a Danny, a PhD from, from Kota who is uh, um, actually a sound designer and also uh, a visual designer, uh, Tai Chi who then uh, designed the visuals as well as so projection as well as uh, the sound and then that kind of will then lead to the changes of the uh, dancers and that in turn should actually then start a feedback loop. So we had the three of those performances and here uh, a small video from one. So I think it uh, gives you kind of a, a good uh, impression on the on the work, and I'm I'm really happy about how everything turned out. Uh, thanks especially also to the collaborators, uh, so uh, Mademoiselle Cinema, the dance group, uh, Session House, and also uh, Kota, so colleague at KMD. So that's about um, uh, what I wanted to 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 cover today, uh, especially at the end, you know, kind of I try to give you a relatively broad overview over uh, the things that I'm uh, working on. Uh, there's, I think, yeah, two more things. Uh, one is, um, um, as I said, I'm, I'm kind of also academic outreach for uh, meme. 
so we will have hopefully in 2021 or 2022 i heard now maybe because i think next year maybe you become also will still go online it's not really clear we will have a, a kind of hackathon or a student competition with uh, with meme at some point in time in the future i think from our side more or less is everything is prepared it just depends on on uh, when uh, ubicom is uh, is happening again um and then if you're interested also on ping me um uh, um ug my contact from jins told me that we can send out two memes to each of the teams that the team can then also keep these are the new ones so this will be 2.0 version and uh, yeah uh, don't really know when this is happening but I just thought i'll bring that out and the other thing also is uh, there's this uh, small conference now also online happening in uh, february in finland augmented humans um i think maybe pedro will also do advertisement because he's i think general chair this year uh and the, the deadline just got extended to 17th uh, december so if you have interesting work that fits for that also on uh, just uh, shameless plug and at the end uh, i just want to say a special thanks to the people that did the actual work so all of the students or so on involved so from uh, pi uh, ding ding george and so on so that's it so yeah thanks so now i'm available for q a or uh yeah um, yeah okay remarks thank you so much kai questions violent um so one thing uh the video you showed with uh, uh mademoiselle cinema the audio wasn't working so if you could share that link oh that would be damn so, it here. sorry yeah. <laughs> sorry oh that's really it was so that lovely was... to watch <laughs> what Oh, sorry. That's really yeah. I can share the. I'll, I'll share the link because the the audio is just the Denny is awesome for yeah. audio cutting. I'll share the link here. I'll just one sec. Yeah. In the meantime, till I search the video, if there are questions or so on or comments. Yeah, yeah. So if you have a question, just unmute yourself and then. Uh, can I go? I don't know if we have. Yeah, go for it, Anne. Yeah, uh, hi Kai. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry I've missed the beginning of the talk, so but I, I've 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 managed to caught most of it. So um, I have two questions, maybe three, well two for now. One first question is very silly. How do you do to get your face on top of your slide? Because I'm very interested. <laughs> well, this is just um, uh, this is what is it called? Hmm. Uh, that's an app that I was in beta in, but you can also use what is it? Ob uh, open. There's an open OBS or so on. So there are a couple of tools, but the the one I'm currently using is. Mm, but okay. it just went out of beta. Uh, it's like mm, so m okay. m m uh, m m. Uh, but it just went out of beta and they want subscriptions now. So I'm not really sure if okay. I'll continue. Cool. I'll yeah. definitely yeah. check Sorry. on it. I thought, I thought it would yeah. be quite cool for teaching video related. So anyway, so maybe back on to research. Um, yeah. uh, I really like your approach on to, you know, and yeah, integration of technology. And I think it's very interesting to think about the technology as we saw it, as you know, you take something off the shelf and you, you charge it overnight and then you put it on your head or something. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I guess, maybe implanted interface and that kind of thing. And I think in the middle, there is a whole range of new devices and new technologies such as wearable fabric, you know, that like the glove you presented or, you know, mm -hmm. things that we, we, we wear. And I think for me, because I'm very interested in that as well, what is tricky at the moment, and I, and I was wondering what your point of view is, but like that's, let's say you take a, 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 a you know, a t-shirt that is interactive. We have this issue that, you know, the t-shirt has to be washed and is sort of like have some damage from users. And so we suddenly have to take in the design requirement that are not any more interactive, but sort of like, you know, more around like, you know, robustness of the material or integration with the everyday life somehow or, or the intrinsic, you know, limitation of a human being that gets dirty somehow. Or do you know what I mean? Like, and so, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I just wondered how, what you thought about, you know, what we should do with those middle range. 
Oh, it's a, that's a tricky question. I mean, for, for me, it's also always, you know, kind of, uh, how do you say? So, I mean, from, from a researcher's perspective, you know, kind of it's usually nice because, you know, now you get also something that on the level of integration or so on, now you, we can really make also textile or so on that people can probably wear on a longer time. But till we are there that we can really have something that, you know, kind of works seamlessly, I think that's still far out. And I feel oh. that's really the hard part about, you know, kind of all of these uh, tech things. Because I mean, I also go to something like Google Glass, for example, that I feel is, you know, from an engineering perspective, great, you know, kind of, yeah, you know, kind of the social issues, there are other issues with it. But even then, you know, kind of, I try to use it. And I think the only person that I still know is Thad, so Thad Sterner from Georgia Tech, who is still wearing it and really using it every day. Uh, but, but other than that, you know, kind of, I just didn't see the it's just too cumbersome and it's just yeah. directly in the face that, you know, kind of you wouldn't want to use it. And I mean, also the glove thing, I mean, the, the, the pressure, I mean, there were some issues with the, uh, um, with the alloy that made it quite hot. So you need mm. quite some ampere, at least for the versions that we use. So that's not something that you easily, you know, kind of can use in, in fabric, but then also if you have something on the fingers, it's just not. Yeah. I would say most people wouldn't want to wear gloves or wouldn't want to wear, you know, kind of, and, and that's actually for me, you know, kind of the, the challenge or the interesting part, can we make something on the technology side that is unobtrusive enough and nice enough that we want to wear it and want to carry it around. And it doesn't disturb, I would say also social interactions. And I think, you know, kind of, if you see the smartphone, everybody uses, but I think, you know, kind of just from a interaction perspective, it's just horrible because you get people, you know, kind of staring down, you get yeah. all kind of economic problems with it. But still, you know, kind of because it is so useful. Yeah, you, ha you have it uh, with you. But I I'm really wondering, you know, kind of what is the space that um, we could we could design something that is, you know, like the glasses that you're wearing, you know, kind of it's unobtrusive it fulfills the purpose as soon as you put it on you don't realize that you wear it anymore and I don't have good answers because so far when I try to create something like that I always failed so mm -hmm. uh, yeah but maybe you know kind of there are a lot of yeah. smart PhD students and researchers around so maybe they have uh, yeah, uh, no, good, so I'm, asking, I'm asking the question because I'm in the same place as you so really this is intriguing so maybe there is something something yeah, so it, yeah, I, I'm I'm quite interested. So I work with uh, so Ching Wang Chen. She's uh, from uh, um, she's now back in China. She was also a postdoc with with uh, Paul Lukowitz and uh, DFKI, and and she looks a lot into textiles. and And I really liked what she did in terms of textile integration in shirts and other things. And she's really about oh, it has to be washable that and that often yeah. or so on that you can use it. And I think there's something I think we will we, we might really see you know kind of uh, something that that is is really usable. On on the eyewear side, I'm still wondering what what Apple is cooking up. So you know, kind of what we will see from 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 that side. I also know that that Google is is seems to work on 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 eyewear um, things. But there, I I really I mean, even though I like the technology, and I think you know, kind of for the future, you know, it's much more wearable than a wristwatch or so on. If if we get there, but I don't see you know kind of any reason why I would want to wear it for the whole day I don't see mm. yet you know kind of the 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 one reason where I would say oh, okay that is useful enough for me as mm. an extension that I won't get over you know kind of normal devices but yeah thank you yeah, yeah, North, there's just also the comment, yeah. They took over North and actually the other part is uh, Google stopped, uh, what is it? Uh, they, they kind of combined all of the optic departments internally. So they put uh, Daydream and uh, uh, also the people from Google Glass and so on together in one part. So I, I don't know if I should, but there's uh, Osan Kamacic. Uh, he's uh, one of the, 
Uh, he's the optics lead for glass. And it's maybe interesting to look into some of his patterns. If you're wondering, I think there, there's a good uh, outline if people are interested, especially in, in the optic side, uh, what is happening. He's uh, one of the old uh, variable folks also. Yeah, quick, Could I ask quick. a question? Oh. Yeah, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to have to shoot off actually. So is it okay to get one? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so I was just wondering, um, with the performance at the end, uh, were the dancers responding to the feedback data or was it kind of <laughs> happening behind them? Um, I wasn't sure if it was implied or, yeah. Yeah, so this, that's actually the problem and we're still working on that. So. So we designed with the choreographer and with the dancers, the piece actually, and we had something in mind also for the different stages. However, it seems at least from the data that we got is that the dancers didn't really respond to the, to the okay. physiological data. It's not about the, the projection was more also for the audience. So, you know, kind of, we didn't expect the dancers to respond to it, but actually the sound also changed. So the sound was uh, partly uh, generated for uh, some pieces, but at least from the movement of the dancers and from the overall performance, we couldn't see a feedback loop in the data. So that's one of the problems that uh, we encountered. It was useful, the dancers really liked this kind of retrospection to go back to the data and look at it and try to understand what happened, also how the three performances differed. Yeah. And, and so now what we're doing now is we kind of, because the problem was also we didn't really we couldn't really train that beforehand. So that was actually also the feedback from the dancers that they want to train with the physiological data. So kind of for the next iteration around, we will also do more training with them so that we can really get the feedback. Yeah, I was, I was gonna ask, is there any possibility of having simulated uh, audience mem members? So giving a, just yep. a, an average data stream back for composition purposes or- Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we did that already for the, the test performances, so for ah, the cool. training, but still, uh, and, and we had some ideas for what should happen, you know, kind of if, you know, people in quotation marks lose interest. So, you know, kind of if you see some, or if you also see spikes in the EDA data. And however, these kind of artificial things didn't really happen in the real performance. So, you know, kind of the sound never went to the place where we thought it might go, even though, you know, kind of we did test screening with students, but a real audience is then still different and the aggregation of the 40 people was then still different. But now we have these uh, three recordings and we can now work on that. And the other, the worst part was that the data we thought we wanted to use, the features we used, they actually show no significance in the different parts for the four performances. Yeah. But now we found actually a couple of uh, data uh, uh, features that actually work and that should show a significant change and we'll, we'll then go from there. But the idea is then to really train with, uh, with the dancers uh, beforehand, yeah. Perfect, th th thanks Kai. So I'm gonna have to sneak off for a meeting, but thanks again for the talk. It was really, really interesting. Yeah, no problem. Right, cool. Yeah, and if somebody is interested in the data, so we can, we can easily share the data now because the paper yeah. DEI is accepted, so Amazing. yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Do I have time for a quick question still, or am I going to drag us over the? Um, is that cool? So that actually, no, uh, that's Pete's question. Also. Great. Pete's question um, kind of nicely leads into this actually. So um, one of the things that I was um, I was really interested in about all of this is this this thing that you're a little bit awkward about, uncomfortable about. I think this idea of human machine integration, which I, I think I share yeah. some of that discomfort with. But it's um, it's definitely a hovering question over all of this, like because there is some degree of integration, some degree of um, augmentation. It's somewhere in that space, and um, mm -hmm. uh, and it made me wonder whether you'd um, whether you'd looked at sort of either dynamical or informational measures of coupling in, in these situations. The degree to which the technology is um, is is integrated, and and particularly, and the reason I say that follows from Pete's question is that. Um, you mentioned there that you were looking at these feedback um, relationships in the um, in the data between the audience and the and I was interested in mm -hmm. what kind of techniques you were using there to look for that feedback. <laughs> yeah, so so this is a little bit. I mean, so for 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 one thing is um, oh that's a really tricky question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
Yeah, no, no, but it's. I mean, it's also something that I that I struggle with a lot uh, in terms of. Um, so, so you know, kind of for the extra arm or for anything that is you know, kind of uh, uh, sensory or so on, uh, sensory augmentation. There are some protocols that you could use from 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 uh, also neuroscience or cognitive science. And I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, kind of new. I have no clue about that field, but I'm sad to read up on it and so on. And for these things, what I thought was, you know, kind of you could, uh, for the, the hand movement thing, something that I want to run is, uh, you know, you do something like Tower of Hanoi with your normal, with your hands. And then you do it with your augmented hands. And after a while, you should actually see mm. that you're moving those augmented hands much more how you would move your normal hands. Yeah. You know, kind of, and I think, you know, kind of that's something that I realized just by looking how people were using it, that, you know, kind of there is some point where, you know, you have this feeling of you have a third arm and then you actually move it more like an arm than a leg. So, so yeah. there's this thing for the dance performance so what we try to do is, I mean, one thing that we can say that the feedback loop didn't work is that, you know, kind of the stuff, the, the, the data, the features that we used, uh, they didn't show any significance between the different parts of the performance. And that is, mm. you know, kind of then, okay, uh, it seems to be in always the same. So, hmm. yeah. uh, so, so kind of that's an indication that it failed. Yeah. Uh, for the, the, the part where, you know, kind of it worked. Uh, so right now, we didn't. Rec we tried to record the dancers, but the wristbands kind of fell off, and we had this this problem. But if you can record the dancers as well, I would assume, and, and probably dancers are a bad example. So I'm also working with uh, Jamie, Jamie Ward. Uh, he's from from. Um, he was at UCL. He's now in Goldsmith. And uh, he, he's an old friend of mine, also from the wearable computing community. He was five years out and he was in acting. He was actually mm -hmm. acting for the BBC and London Theatre and did this work. And, and actually, I think maybe acting would be, and I'm talking with him about this, might be a better example where we could see something. Because I would expect that if you get these feedback loops, you get some type of synchronization. Yeah, yeah. And I also want to see now you kind of the synchronization in terms of heart rate and EDA, what happens in the audience, what happens to people that sit closer together versus further apart or so mm. on. And that could be an indication for it. But it's really, I'm, I'm also not sure, I'm not sure how to measure it. And I'm also not sure how to induce it because it's such a close uh, yeah. a, cl a closed feedback loop but it's definitely something i mean if you're talking about integration you know you get this subjective feeling but then yeah, yeah. you know kind of how do you measure it it's yeah it's tricky but it's a fun thing to think about so also if you're going that direction i'm happy to to discuss these things further so also yeah. you know kind of for at least for eda and heart rate we have now a couple of features that at least work in something like a performance scale so PNN 50 was something from the heart rate variability features okay. that was great for, this shows you a little bit relaxation can also be mean boredom or, or stress. And, and for the EDA, it was tricky, but we found some, some interesting uh, peak detection algorithm for memorable, memorable scenes. And, and I feel over that maybe, you know, kind of you could, you could then see some type of of uh, of change, and I then also you know re-recording the 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 same performance over and over again with different audiences, and then mm -hmm. kind of figuring out at least changes. It's still subjective, you know, kind of it's it's pretty hard, and also the whole physiological signal stuff, you know, kind of even if I say oh we did this alert study or so on or fatigue study, if it's in the wild, you're never you know kind of yeah you see some correlations, but yeah, you, you can never be be sure that, you know, kind of you really sub, uh, objectively, you don't objectively capture anything in that case, I think. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I have a slight interest in this. Uh, so it will be great to chat to you afterwards. I've been looking at some informational and dynamical measures of, of this kind of coupling. So it, it particularly, um, oh, cool. so it'd be really great to chat to you about this. I'll perhaps drop you a mail after we've, um, after this. Yeah, yeah just uh, send me a mail. So, uh, yeah. Elaine has my contact, or it's also on the website. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, can I ask a question, a quick question? For sure. Yeah. Uh, 
So, so um, I really like the your project about the wearable um eyeglasses that you made for the everyday wearing purposes. Um, but but my question is, um, does it require a calibration for different individuals? Because because the people have they come from different age groups and they have different um skeletal skeletal feature, and also the some people may just uh, sweat more than other people. And so how how to make sure the um um that the sensor can capture the change of the um, variabilities for different person. Yeah, so this depends on the eyewear. So the one that I showed, the the, the effective wear, the one that we build ourselves with the distance to the skin, that mm -hmm. needs uh, uh, calibration. So that's user dependent. Also, the modeling is user dependent. Uh, and I actually, there's a big problem with uh, actually with noses. So uh, for even for the 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 meme, the uh, the other one, the commercial one with the electrodes, uh, for that uh, when I tried the first prototypes, it didn't work on me because uh, my my nose spec is uh, a little bit too broad compared to mm -hmm. to Japanese noses. And we had uh, similar issues. Actually, you see the similar issues also with with eye trackers. For the meme now, this works. So there's sometimes an issue where you have to bend the electrode slightly, but the the mm -hmm. um, we get a signal from everybody. It depends on how strong the signal is, but you can use it for something like smooth pursuit or the itchy nose that works more or less out of the box. So these models are okay. Uh, for this one issue um i don't know if chins likes that if i say that but there's one issue with makeup actually we have some issue with makeup so yeah. if you're sweating for electrodes it's actually better so that's nice because then you get a stronger signal but uh, there are some makeup where you won't get a good signal otherwise uh, for the the effective wear for the distance sensor yeah you need uh, um a calibration so person dependent it's also a person dependent model i would say it's not so bad because you can probably uh, get around, you know, kind of with a couple of, uh, you could probably do something self-learning after a while. Mm -hmm. So you have to train it at yeah. the beginning, but after a while, I think it could, it can figure out clusters. We did some clustering with it. And then if it's a personal device, if it's something that you're wearing, I think that is okay. The bigger problem is, is uh, making glasses that fit a large user group, especially international user group, is actually quite difficult. So mm -hmm. the glasses design is actually something that is much more trickier than the kind of interpreting the sensor, the sensor values. Yeah, but is that possible that you separate the glasses with the sensors so that to make it um, so the people can assemble it? For example, people have their own glasses and then the sensor can just attach to the glass. So to, to realize the personalization. Yeah, yeah, we haven't really done that too much. I mean, there's some work, I mean, for the for the, the thermal sensors or so on that works, but for other things, I mean, for that you need skin contact. So it's kind of mm -hmm. hard to put it somewhere in that you have the electrodes. The, the, the distance sensors could actually work. It's maybe a nice idea actually for a master student or so on, just to make a snap on to glasses. So you get the distance sensors that could work, yeah. Yeah, I really like to try it um, with, um, by myself. So so in, do you have the um, API or SDK for, for people to try with their um, own purposes? For example, um, so if, if it's possible to get the, um, the data to record the data or just to read it in the real time to do a simple control, something like that. Which one, the, the meme, so the, the commercial one, that's actually possible. It's mm -hmm. a little bit tricky because uh, we are just in between versions. So the software tools are, unfortunately, there's some Bluetooth, let's put it like that. There's some Bluetooth trouble with some phones and with some, with mm -hmm. some, uh, but, but at least streaming to a Windows laptop uh, or desktop is, is easy. And I think mm -hmm. if you're interested in that case, uh, you know, kind of Jin's one's usually some kind of uh, idea what it is for or so on, but I still have a couple of classes that I can send out. So if you have an idea for, you know, kind of some, if you have an idea for some kind of publication or for something that you want to use it for, I think I can just send you one over.
Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. So, so um, I'm I'm currently working with the surgeons. So, um, we are we are um trying to find a way to record the um the eye movements of the surgeons while they are doing a very complex um, um surgical tasks. So, so currently we are using the um the Toby, the eye tracker. But that one is very heavy, oh. and also it's um, so when the surgeon do the task, and especially do the macro surgery, they have to look look into um, the tissues through the microscope, and with the with that the high um, very heavy Toby eye tracking, when the surgeon look mm -hmm. into the uh, microscope, it's just falling down. So it's um, so it's not very easy oh, to. That's that's interesting because I would have recommended you uh, uh, eye tracking classes for that task, but that's interesting. If there's something where the the, the problem with the meme is, as you saw, the data is fairly noisy usually mm -hmm. uh, compared to. I mean, and you won't get you know you won't get saccades and fixations out, so you'll just get mm -hmm. left and right or or uh, up and down oh, in I the best see. cases, and 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 mm -hmm. also I you get eye blink. So I mean. We can try, but uh, you know, from a from a situation where you are in a in a stationary setup, um, it could be interesting. I mean, at least if there's some some um, some problem where the normal eye tracker does not work. The I, I like the I played just a little bit with it. I think the accuracy is worse, but I really like the the pupil invisible. They look quite nice. Mm. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, but as I said, I mean, it's it's okay if you want to play with it. I can send mm -hmm. one 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 pair of glasses over to to Bristol and have a couple of people play with it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Could I ask a sorry, a very quick follow up question related to that one there? So, I was just thinking mm -hmm. when you were saying about the um, obviously with the the electrode based eye tracking eye tracking, um, I, you've it, got yeah, yeah I. I uh, another EOG electrooculography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With yeah. with this, um, yeah. I was thinking. So, are you are you pre-processing that feature before you send it out to get the direction, or is it being sent? Are you sending out the raw electrode signals? No, this is raw electrode signals. Right. We have yeah, some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we you you get the raw. So it's hundred hertz. Uh, the elect. It, yeah. I can say because they didn't tell me, but actually there's there's a there there is a Kalman filter on it. Yeah, there's, okay, okay. There's some small processing, but otherwise okay. it's it's actually the raw data. Okay. Uh, and really that's also one of the problems. So we have to figure out how to interpret it. We have a blink, or we have a couple of blink detection algorithms and also saccade detection, but it always is a little bit. You have to adjust it for individual people. But okay. yeah. That's great. We should definitely talk about this stuff then. That's really interesting. Oh, uh, okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or else? I don't know. Um, what we could do is if you guys wanted to chat now, although I know it's late for you, Kai. I think it's what, 11 15? <laughs> yeah, 11 15. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if you wanted to set up a different time to chat with uh, Dan and Fink. Um, yeah, that that's probably good. I can hang around okay, for yeah. around five minutes or so on, but uh, I think it's probably better if uh, um, we, yeah, we set we up do... a different time because yeah, yeah, hmm? yeah. Well, well, if ever, if no one else has any questions, what I can do is that we can leave this open for the three of you to exchange information, and then yeah, I mean we can talk for maybe five more minutes or so on. I'm just uh, quite tired. Depends also on the time of, <laughs> of the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Well, um, I'm going to first stop recording and then uh, say thank you. Thank you so much. It was very good. Thanks. It was a nice, yeah. I, I like that you had a nice bridge between both our last talk and then our next talk. So, yes. Yeah, it fit quite in. I also thought, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was a little bit, I think, uh, I hope it was not too, too random, but I thought I, I'll try to cover, you know, kind of a broader range because I was not sure what people were interested in and so on. So, uh, yeah. And now, uh, yeah, if if there's uh, travel is is enabled again and so on, you know, drop by if you're close to, to Tokyo or Yokohama, uh, definitely visit us. And uh, yeah, no, sometimes there's also some cool stuff going on. So, so in terms of uh, know, open was... house or other things. 
Hmm? Yeah, Kai was supposed to be in uh, to uh, Yokohama next year, and I was so excited because I was like, "Oh my god, yes. it's gonna be right <laughs> now! It's online." <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm really, and I feel. I mean, honestly, uh, I, I was one of the the uh, local arrangement uh, chairs, and actually, uh, Masa Okata and me, we went also to the mm -hmm. venue and we did uh, 360 degree and some live streams for the the community, so for the a site visit so we did a virtual site visit at the time it just Masa and me could go there because uh, of the rich uh, travel restrictions mm -hmm. in in Japan so even uh, Kitamura could not could not come and and yeah and I was actually also really excited because we had a couple of cool ideas already in the in the chat and uh, so on and yeah but no it's not happening so I know. I'm so bummed. I was so excited because I was like, I knew where it was. I was like, I could go and I'd be able to find it. <laughs> yeah, but there's one thing there might be. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, there might be some kind of local event actually in Japan at the same time. And uh, yeah, the thing is, I, I don't know. Have you been to one of the cooking parties? No, I don't uh, think no? I have. So guys, tell, oh, okay, guys, you, we do a cooking party just very close oh. to the venue. There's a very beautiful, there's a kind of co-working space with excellent coffee. I mean, that's something, you know, you're not allowed to say to anybody at Kai because otherwise, you know, kind of this place would have been dead. But there's excellent coffee co-working space and they have a nice kitchen and you can do actually uh, uh, some some cooking there. So I was already thinking about doing some something oh, along the lines of uh, computing and food. But uh, yeah, it won't happen. It's really, it's it's quite sad actually, yeah. But we'll just have to plan a, a different conference. You can do, uh, do you still plan augmented humans? Uh, yeah, so we're thinking so, about, I'm not sure if, yeah, yeah. I mean, right now we thought, but I mean, we brought it to Germany. So DFKI had augmented humans last year, and now uh, mm -hmm. Joanna Hickinen uh, will have it in, who will hold it in, in Finland. But uh, yeah, also completely virtual, unfortunately. So so uh, so, and we wanted to actually extend the augmented humans to more Europe and US. So we are actually looking more okay. for, you know, kind of European and US places because the Japanese uh, research community or Asian community, I would say also with Kais, is already quite strong and we need to branch out. And I'm a little bit sad because with Joanna, we had already, uh, uh, we had already cool ideas also for, for this year, for next year's uh, augmented humans. Uh, so in terms of also more design competition and so on. But, yeah. Well, I guess then, um, I don't know, did Dan and Dang, did you want to stick around and talk with I'm Kai to, to it sounds, exchange it from... It sounds like yeah. you're quite tired though, Kai. Should, was it easier yeah. if we drop you a, um, drop you a mail or something? Yeah, I mean, we can... I think I'll have around five minutes or so, so we can. Oh no, maybe it's better. Better drop a mail because then I'm I'm fully there. Because uh, I just wondered. I don't know for you guys, but we just had the Kai rebuttal this morning. Deadline was five a.m., and uh, I'm still feeling a little bit groggy from that. Uh, so uh, then it's better. Then I, I'm also fresh for the discussions. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's uh, it's about um, twelve o'clock at night. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's 11, 1130. Almost right 12. Almost 12. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do do you, you have his email? This time. Yeah. So, sorry, it's very hmm? kind of you to be up at this time for us. And yeah, I think um, if Dan and Feng can contact yeah. you via email and then rearrange another time, that'd be great. Um, but yeah. 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 Thank you very much for the talk. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting yes. me. Yeah, and uh, Thank nice no, I'm so happy. It was me. like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was really nice. I love seeing all the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so take care. See you. Yep. Bye. Okay.